Uh, we must now move to questions for the Minister of Justice. Inform the House that questions 8 and 14 have been withdrawn. I call Mr William Irwin. Number one, Mr Principal Dr. Speaker. Minister. Principal Deputy Speaker, excise evasion on fuel and the related legislation is a reserved matter and the responsibility of HM Revenue and Customs and the Treasury. Between February and May of this year, HMRC consulted on a discussion document relating to penalties, the first stage in a wider review aimed at making it hard for the dishonest minority to cheat the system, including, of course, filling stations selling illicit fuel. In addition, they are continuing to look at the legislative issues regarding naming and shaming filling stations where laundered diesel has been found, something that I have been pursuing with them. My department and HMRC are currently organising a seminar on fuel laundering to be held in June. It will involve all relevant agencies and will be a forum to discuss whether there are areas in which more can be done. Well, Mr Irwin, for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his response. Given that a, a fairly recent survey identified that up to 50 per cent of filling stations in Northern Ireland are selling laundered fuel, does the Minister feel that legislation is in place to deal with this? Because uh, Naming and shaming uh, filling, filling stations is one thing, but um, surely it's a criminal offence to sell illicit fuel. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, of course, yes, it is a criminal offence, and prosecutions are the responsibility of HMRC. Uh, members do have a need to be careful about quoting the numbers of filling stations uh, that may be committing this offence. Um, not particularly helped by a press release issued some time ago by HMRC, uh, which referred to the number of filling stations involved in selling laundered fuel, as opposed to the number of occasions on which detections had been made. The number. Uh, with multiple offences means that the number which have actually been engaged uh, in that process is significantly lower. My understanding is that in the last two years, the number of individual retail sites which were found to be in possession of illicit fuel was 33 in 2013-14 and 45 in 2014-15, a lot less than half. Call Mr Sean Lynch. Uh, is the Minister satisfied that all necessary steps have been taken to ensure that only legal diesel has been sold at uh, filling stations? Well, no, Principal Deputy Speaker. That's why I'm in constant contact with the Treasury to seek to ensure uh, that action is taken robustly. Um, there are issues about confidentiality of individuals' tax returns, which are entirely different from protecting the public where illicit fuel is being sold in petrol stations. And even in the context of where um, the nominal ownership of a petrol station may change hands, leaving individuals vulnerable, even if there are prosecutions against those who perpetrated the crime in the first place. So I do believe a lot more needs to be done, and I will continue to pursue it with the Treasury. Well, Ms. Sandra Overend. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Indeed, this is a very serious issue and, and ongoing, even in my own constituency of Middlestar. Uh, can the Minister state what impact the National Crime Agency uh, being able to operate in Northern Ireland is likely to have on measures to break up the criminal gangs responsible for fuel laundering? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm, I'm always encouraged when members of this House want to highlight the benefits of the NCA. Of course, in the specific issue of non-devolved crime, which excise duty is, uh, there's no additional benefit, though we are aware that those gangs which launder fuel are also engaged in other varieties of crime, some of which is devolved crime. So therefore, I have no doubt that when the NCA becomes operational next week, they will add to our overall fight against organised criminals generally. Call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr. President, the Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. Can the Minister state what discussions have taken place with the mainstream oil companies who import oil and onto this island, and what advice does he have for those that want to run a legal filling station but who can't compete with the contraband? Well, I haven't had direct discussions, though I will be shortly having discussions uh, with those who operate in the legal trade. Um, Mr Byrne makes an entirely valid point about ensuring that people are able to support only those selling legitimate fuel. One of the key issues, of course, is the fact that the new marker is now in place, and that is significantly uh, better in terms of ensuring that it cannot be laundered without very considerable expense, and I think that, that will certainly assist in the fight against organised criminals, and certainly uh, within a very short time, all diesel sold across the UK and Ireland will have the new market in it. So I think that's a key area. Um, the fact that we're having not only our own uh, conference, but also a European-wide conference 
this year based in Northern Ireland is an indication that we are leading the fight here, but clearly we need to ensure that we use every possible means, and I do believe that naming and shaming will be a key part of that. I call Mr. Pat Sheehan. Uh, to date, my department has not repatriated any individual either into or out of this jurisdiction under the new compulsory return arrangements that were introduced by the EU Council framework decision on the transfer of sentence pensions persons. Rather, we have continued to rely on the terms of the original 1983 convention, which provided for agreed repatriations. Since April 2010, we have repatriated 11 individuals and accepted two into this jurisdiction from EU member states. Call Mr. Sheehan for a supplementary. I thank the Minister for his answer. I'm just wondering, uh, could the Minister give us a time frame as to when this issue can be resolved completely? Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I'm not sure that this issue needs to be resolved in that sense on the basis that the original arrangements are working well in this jurisdiction, provi provide for repatriation in a way which aids rehabilitation and reduces the likelihood of reoffending. In terms of the specific issues, whilst a majority of EU member states have already signed up to the new proposals, uh, in particular, Ireland has not and therefore it is not possible to use the compulsory arrangements for repatriation with the Republic of Ireland. Uh, but at the moment, I have no reason to believe that the current uh, use of the original 83 Convention is inadequate. Mr Gregory Campbell. <coughs> Thank you, Mr Speaker. Uh, given the ongoing changing nature of the EU and the possible change that, that may come uh, over the course of the next few years, has the Minister had any discussions <coughs> with his counterparts in the rest of the United Kingdom should the compulsory element be required, given the changing nature of the EU in the future? Uh, no, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have not yet had any discussions with those who uh, bear these particular responsibilities uh, in uh, Westminster or in Whitehall, to be more specific. Um, I will await and see what further proposals there may be, depending upon what discussions the UK Government has with the EU. Call Mr Alban McGuinness. Uh, uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. Um, just in relation to the Republic of Ireland, uh, has there been any discussion with the Minister for Justice in relation to the current position uh, of the uh, Government of the Republic in relation to prisoner transfers under the EU arrangements? No, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have not had the opportunity to discuss uh, that particular issue with Frances Fitzgerald since the issue arose, but I will be meeting her shortly and I expect it will feature at that meeting. Mr. Robin Swan. The consultation on the rationalisation of the court estate will run until the 18th of May, i.e. today, Principal Deputy Speaker. The responses to the consultation will then be analysed and recommendations prepared. I have met a number of MLAs, local councillors and community representatives, including a delegation from Palomina, to discuss the consultation. No final decisions on any of the proposals will be made until the autumn. Thank you very much, Mr. Deputy Speaker. I appreciate the Minister says the consultation closes today, but can I give a reassurance that this consultation isn't just dressing and that the decision hasn't already been taken to close Ballymena Courthouse? Because that is the perception between practitioners, the judicial system, and everybody else who's involved with Ballymena Courthouse at this present time. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, if people examine the record of the DOJ on consultations, um, for example, on prison some time ago, which the members for East London Derry will recall as one staring straight at me at the moment, uh, they're an indication that when the DOJ does consultations, we actually listen to the contents of the consultation. So I must say, I was slightly surprised, um, given that I wrote to the Chief Executive of Mid and East Antrim Council on the 26th of March about uh, contacts on possible uses, uh, community uses of the courthouse in Ballymena, which had been suggested at my meeting with them, to discover that in last week's uh, local papers in Antrim and Ballymena, uh, there was a report that the council was demanding to get names of people to speak to in the DOJ from me, despite the fact that they were told of it on the 26th of March. But I'm keen that those discussions should happen. Mr. Duffy Mackay. Can I ask the minister? 
Uh, again, will he ensure that this isn't uh, a consultation with a predetermined outcome, as has been the case before, as, as the previous member said? And how is he taking into consideration the rural impact? How is this decision going to be rural proofed uh, when it reaches those conclusions? Well, I'm not sure how many times I have to say this is a consultation and there are no predetermined answers, but if Mr Mackay likes, I'll say, Principal Deputy Speaker, this is a consultation and there are no, no, no predetermined answers. Um, those who have read the consultation document will have seen references to things like travel times, and clearly there are issues uh, which have some effect, but the key thing for me is to ensure that when people reach a courthouse, they get the best possible facilities there, not necessarily that there is a courthouse close at hand, but that there is a fit-for-purpose courthouse within a reasonable travelling distance. Mr. Jim Mollister. Some of us might be surprised to hear the Minister speak of the efficacy of the Department's response to consultations, bearing in mind his I know better response to the overwhelming rejection of his fetal abnormality consultation. But on this consultation, can he tell us, has there been a single response supportive of closing Balamina Courthouse? Because certainly there wasn't at the public meeting held. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, of course, in the case of fatal fetal abnormality, the view that I took was that those who know most about this, the medical professions, the, uh, the nurses and the midwives, know better than I do or others do. Um, the answer is, uh, when the consultation hasn't closed, I haven't seen the report of responses, and therefore I can't answer what the current responses are in this consultation. Well, Mr. John Dowd. Uh, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker, I'm not directly involved in this popular campaign to keep Ballymena Courthouse open, but could I ask the Minister that, given that socially deprived people without transport are overrepresented in those that appear in court, does he think his policy of closing courthouses across the north, and particularly in Limavady, I must say, was a bright idea? Um, Principal Deputy Speaker, I don't think the cuts that were imposed on my department's budget were a particularly bright idea, but I have to live with them. Mr. Stuart Dixon. Uh, thank you, uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, would you agree with me that the effective and efficient running of our court service should be paramount in determining any uh, use of the court estate, particularly when it comes to uh, the uh, use of the court estate for those who are victims, and that they should have victim-friendly courthouses with appropriate facilities in them? Yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, that was a point which I tried to make at an earlier stage. The important issue is that we have the best possible facilities for people who are using courthouses, not that they are necessarily close at hand. We are not in the days when the resident magistrate rode round on his pony to assorted courthouses in the back rooms of hotels and community halls and whatever. We have to ensure that, for example, victims get properly treated, that young people are segregated from adults, and that all those issues are better done in some of our more modern courthouses, as indeed I inspected at Lagonside just last week. That is the challenge, to ensure that the courthouses are fit for purpose, not that they are at every street corner. Well, Mr Gordon Dunn. For Mr Principal Deputy Speaker. The community policing structure within North Down is an operational matter for the Chief Constable, who is accountable to the Policing Board. However, I have every confidence in the Chief Constable and his senior officers to put appropriate structures in place within all of the new policing districts. Mr. Don, for a supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers. But as Justice Minister, does the Minister recognise the need for continuation of community policing? locally within the North Down area for places like Hollywood and Bangor, and that we have local police available, not eight or ten miles away, but they're available locally within the, the area where they know people, where they communicate and where they build vital relationships. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, as I made clear, Mr Dunn's question is about operational matters for the Chief Constable. But faced with the budget cuts which have been imposed on the DOJ, a large measure which has had to be passed to the police, even though they have been protected compared to other areas of justice spending. It has been for the Chief Constable to determine how he prioritises, and he clearly has to prioritise certain elements of his work over others, which we might perhaps all agree are desirable, but not necessarily essential at a time of difficulty. Well, Mr. Colum Eastwood. 
Principal Deputy Speaker, I am unable to give an assessment of Sir Keir Starmer's independent review as the report of his findings has not yet been published. Mr. Reesford for supplementary. Uh, that brings me nicely to my supplementary, uh, Mr. Uh, Principal Deputy Speaker. When will the report be published? <laughs> well, Principal Deputy Speaker, a very reasonable question, but since Sir Keir Starmer was preparing a report, uh, for Baron McGrory, the DPP, and not for the DOJ. Um, I'm not entirely clear on that point. My understanding is it is likely to be published within the next week, but it is in the hands of Sir Keir and the DPP, not me or anybody to do with the DOJ. Well, Mr. Trevor Long. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. It's question number six. I am committed to implementing the elements of the Stormont House Agreement that fall to my department as promptly as possible. Under the agreement, my department is responsible for the establishment of the new Historical Investigations Unit and improving the legacy inquest function. The HIU will be an independent body to take forward investigations into outstanding troubles-related deaths. The legislation required to set up the HIU will be progressed through a Westminster Bill. Drafting is at an advanced stage, and I would expect the bill to be introduced in Parliament in the autumn. My intention is to establish the HIU by summer 2016 and for it to be operational by the autumn of next year. In developing this legislation, my officials have been working closely with key stakeholders, including victims and victims groups. The early recruitment of the HIU's director will be taken forward by OFM-DFM in consultation with my department. Plans are underway to have the post filled by December this year. To improve the way the legacy inquest function is conducted, a number of changes are being progressed. These include the allocation of cases to a higher judicial tier, to case manage and hear legacy inquests. To allow that to happen, it has been agreed that the existing county court judicial complement will be increased. I will also be meeting with the Lord Chief Justice to discuss when he will assume the role of President of the Coroner's Court in accordance with the Legal Aid and Coroner's Act, North Nine, 2014. My department has been set a challenging agenda by the agreement, but work is well underway to deliver the necessary changes. Mr. Lund, for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. Um, I notice confidence that the HIU can be set up and operational by autumn 2016, but would he share my fear that the lack of agreement on other matters, in particular welfare reform, presents a real risk to the interests of victims and families and survivors who have placed their hopes in the Stormont House Agreement? Well, yes, Principal Deputy Speaker, I have to agree with my colleague. There is no doubt that good work has been done uh, to a certain extent at the party leaders' meetings, certainly in terms of the work being done by my officials, and also I would have to acknowledge work being done by officials within the Northern Ireland Office who will be carrying the responsibility for the bill at Westminster in conjunction with my officials. But what is absolutely clear is there are many other aspects of the Storm and House Agreement, most particularly around welfare reform, which have not yet been dealt with and which have the potential to derail the entire process to the real damage of those who were victims of the past and who have invested their hopes in Stormont House Agreement delivering for them. Mr. Raymond McCartney. Thank you very much, Principal Deputy Speaker. I cannot thank the Minister for his answers to date. Can I ask the Minister, irrespective of what works out in terms of the Stormont House Agreement, that the autonomy and the independence of the inquest system remains unchanged? Yes, I can certainly assure Mr McCartney that the uh, legacy inquest will remain entirely unchanged in terms of autonomy. What will be happening is by um, assigning uh, judges from a higher tier to take responsibility for some of these legacy inquests. It will, we trust, ensure that matters proceed uh, more speedily, more effectively and more efficiently, particularly for the benefit of those who are bereaved and who have been seeking uh, a full, proper inquest, as they would see it, for some considerable period of time. Uh, that is an issue which, as I said, I will be discussing shortly with the Lord Chief Justice in looking at his responsibilities, and I hope that we will see significant progress around that area. But there is the matter of legislation going in one single bill at Westminster, which may be derailed by other matters. Mr. Patsy McGlone. Thanks very much, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers up until this point. Um, dealing with and expanding probably on uh, Mr. Lund's theme, uh, particularly in relation to those legacy and historic inquiry issues, uh, is the Minister satisfied that there will be enough funding 
to deal with those very important matters? Well, the precise detail of funding is not entirely clear at this stage, depending exactly how much is done at what pace. Uh, Mr. McClone raises an entirely reasonable question. Um, certainly, in very rough figures, uh, we are uh, now um, offered £30 million per year for five years by the Treasury, um, on top of what was probably in the region of £10 million going from the existing justice system for something which could be potentially costing up to £50 million a year. So that detail will have to be worked through. Uh, my uh, officials have been starting to do a considerable amount of work on that, but of course until we get wider agreement on other issues, we're not guaranteed that we will receive that money from the Treasury, though it is clear that we need that money and we need it rapidly. Mr David Hilditch. Thank you. Question 7. The certification of firearms is a matter for the Chief Constable. I am advised he has a complement of 35 members of staff in firearms licensing branch at police headquarters to process firearms certificates. There are also 29 locally based firearms inquiry officers who are involved in the licensing process. I have a small team which processes firearms appeals and prohibitions in devolved cases, as does the NIO for non-devolved cases. Hildich for supplement. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answer. I suppose the crux of the question is all about efficiencies and improvement of service. It appears there are quite a lengthy turnaround periods at times, and I've uh, been quoted several months. I just wonder if the Minister had any discussions on how this could be improved. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, there have been discussions for a considerable period of time. Uh, we are obliged to adopt a full cost recovery model uh, by DFP, and it is clear that the current payments uh, are not covering the costs, which is why there is a proposal for a fee increase. I am also keen to see that that proceeds in as efficient way as possible. And indeed, my officials had a meeting just last week uh, with representatives of elements of the, uh, the gun trade and others in terms of discussing how that might apply. I believe there was some uh, progress made around fees, as we also looked at other issues like a banded system, which would provide further benefits for those who shoot. Mrs. Judith Cochran. Question number nine, please. The Prison Service Employability Strategy is a public commitment to supporting individuals in custody to develop qualifications, skills and experience linked to labour market needs in order to increase their potential for gaining employment on release. The strategy aims to expand the opportunities for individuals to gain practical work experience whilst in custody that mirrors the expectations of employers and better prepares them for the workplace. Significant progress has been made, including engaging with employers to dispel some of the myths around employing people who have offended, increasing the number of placement opportunities available for prisoners as part of the pre-release process, establishing a corporate and standardised approach to working with employers. Alongside the employability strategy, work is also progressing to improve the levels of educational attainment amongst prisoners and provide them with specific skills aimed at supporting employment. When responsibility for learning and skills in the prison establishments transfers to Belfast Metropolitan College and the Northwest Regional College, an accredited course in employability skills will be offered to all prisoners. The course is designed to support an individual to successfully gain employment, progress in their chosen field, prepare them for further study when necessary, and support the development of techniques required for successful independent living. I am confident that through the implementation of the employability strategy and our work to improve skills, we will significantly increase the opportunities available to prisoners on their release and support desistance from crime. Mrs. Cochrane, for supplementary. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer and welcome the strong focus being placed on improving the employability prospects um, of prisoners and the resulting impact um, on reducing uh, reoffending rates. Can I ask the Minister what more uh, the prison service uh, can do to engage with the private sector uh, to seek their support in this important initiative? Well, certainly, Principal Deputy Speaker, there has been work done engaging with the private sector over the last year or two, which has seen some significant progress. Uh, yes, last year, 53 new employers engaged and committed to working with the prison service to provide placement opportunities across Northern Ireland for those in custody and being released from custody. November last year, uh, the prison service held a recruiting with conviction event for employers to raise awareness and understanding of community sentences. And the prison service has also been working in conjunction with the UK national-wide organisation, the Employers Forum for Reducing Reoffending, 
to help establish a similar strategic employer network local to Northern Ireland. Uh, a number of placements are now actively being provided uh, by prisoners in all, four prisoners in all three establishments, and I believe it shows a significant amount of good progress being made. And certainly, I'm extremely grateful to those employers who have seen the benefits from that, including, of course, some which are nationally based and which have previously worked in Great Britain uh, to provide opportunities for prisoners. So it's something which I trust we will see further work going through, particularly as we look at learning the lessons from the Employers' Forum. Mr. Alistair Ross. Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker, I think everybody in the House would certainly rather see ex-offenders getting proper jobs when released from prison rather than living a life on, on welfare at the cost of, of the taxpayer. But how much more difficult is it to do this when the budgets of organisations such as NIACRO, who do so much good work with former uh, prisoners and with uh, employers in terms of trying to find them meaningful employment, how much more difficult is it to achieve those goals when uh, organisations such as NIACRO are getting their budgets cut? Well, I certainly agree with Mr Ross that it is more difficult when some of our voluntary sector partners are losing money, particularly in the context of the ASF funding, which NACRA was unsuccessful on this year. Uh, but the reality is we are seeking to manage as best we can, looking with a range of private sector employers directly, as well as with the good work which was being done by organisations like NACRO and Extern. But it is all part of living with the difficult budget settlement that we have, and we are seeking to make the best job we can, despite the cuts. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Would the Minister acknowledge that the work track programme run by NACRO in terms of its outcomes had very successful results, uh, but that as a result of the loss of funding, some 36 uh, experienced uh, workers in this sector will have lost their jobs? And what gives him the confidence that that good work can be replaced by the further education colleges? Well, I think there are a number of different strands which go together. I fully acknowledge, and I repeat to Mr. Beggs, that there are problems with the cuts which have uh, had to be made from a variety of different backgrounds on organisations like NACRO. But the direct work which is being done with employers, the work which will be taken forward, including specific formal skills by the two FE colleges when they take over responsibility, will all assist. But it's a key issue which requires a lot of effort, and it is difficult to do all we would wish to do given the cuts being imposed on the department. That is the unfortunate reality. Well, Ms. Anna Lowe. Question number 10, please. With permission, Mr. Speaker, I'll take questions 10 and 11 together. The recent remarks by the First Minister on the subject of guidelines for abortion contradict previous statements by the former DUP Health Minister Edwin Poots when he said on more than one occasion the guidelines were unable to deal with cases of fetal abnormality and that such cases would require an amendment to the criminal law, which was a matter for the Department of Justice. It is therefore hard to understand the reasons for the First Minister's comments. As I've said previously, guidelines can only define the law at the present time. They can't change the law. It is simply not correct to say that we can resolve the tragedies of women carrying fetuses with fatal abnormalities by changing the guidelines. Currently, in the circumstances of fatal fetal abnormality, a woman can have an abortion in Northern Ireland only if there is a risk to her life or a risk of serious permanent or long-term injury to her mental or physical health. Where a woman does not meet this test but feels she cannot continue with the pregnancy, she is prevented by our law from having an abortion in Northern Ireland. Following consideration of responses to the recent consultation, I am proposing a change in the law to provide a statutory exemption to allow for a lawful abortion to be an option for a woman who has received a diagnosis in pregnancy of a fatal fetal abnormality. These tragic circumstances can only be addressed by changing the criminal law, which will provide clarity for both practitioners and for the women faced with the devastating diagnosis of fatal fetal abnormality. Well, Ms. Lowe for a supplementary. I thank the Minister uh, for his response and for the work uh, he has been doing on this very difficult issue. Can he advise the Assembly whether he now intends to proceed to take his proposal to the Executive, and does he believe that the Executive should allow the Assembly to consider legislation on the issue rather than blocking it? Well, yes, the answer is simple. I gave a commitment that there would be a paper to the executive from the Department of Justice on this issue, making a recommendation in this narrow area to allow uh, abortions 
in circumstances of fatal fetal abnormality. That was the commitment I gave. That is what I have instructed officials to do, and I trust that we will have a paper prepared in the very near future, which will go to the executive. And I trust that those who said that they don't think such a measure could pass the Assembly will allow the executive to put it to the Assembly so that the views of the representatives of the people of Northern Ireland can be tested in this chamber. That ends the period for listed questions. We now move on to topical questions, and I call Mr. Alistair Ross. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. Last week, um, the ACRO hosted a very informative event here in Parliament Buildings uh, with Karen McCluskey, who was the, the guest speaker. She was director of Scottish Violence Reduction Unit. She talked about particularly the importance of early interventions with children. Um, and as we are all aware, it is sadly too easy to identify those children in society who are most at risk of offending. To that end, can I ask the Minister what collaborative actions he has taken with the Minister for Health and the Minister for Education in terms of helping to identify those most at risk of offending and having the appropriate early interventions so they do not uh, enter the, the justice sector uh, in later life? Well, I am happy to confirm the general tenor of my, my committee chair's question. Um, there, there are, in a sense, there are two issues we need to talk about, one of which is early interventions in the context of interventions in early childhood to prevent children in families that might otherwise have difficulties, and there are early interventions for those who perhaps in their early teenage years are in danger of getting sucked into criminal activity. The former is clearly not particularly the responsibility of the DOJ, and indeed, when we look at uh, the lifestyles of some of the families with whom a number of voluntary groups are working um, in projects like the, um, as I've seen the West Belfast and the Shankill uh, community interventions, uh, there, um, there are benefits to health and social care within a year or two of, of getting involved in such a project. There are benefits to education in two or three years, and there are benefits to justice in 10 years, which is why it is more difficult for us to justify at a time of uh, limited expenditure. Nonetheless, the department is participating in some of those projects and will continue to participate in those projects, as well as the work that we're doing on diversionary activity for young teenagers. Call Mr. Ross for supplementary. Thank you. I thank the Minister for, for that answer. When we're talking about young people who, who are offending, it's a stark reality that between 55 and 65 per cent of those young people have some sort of communication issue, which may well have led to the circumstances which they're in. Uh, back in September 2013, the, the Minister, along with the Health Minister at the time, had funded a speech and language therapist for Woodbank. Is this something that the Minister would consider doing again, given that funding for that has been cut, in order to help those young people try to turn their lives around? Well, yes, I'm grateful to Mr. Ross for pointing that out. Members will be aware of uh, my intention to provide a full-time speech and language therapist for the Youth Justice Agency, principal for those who are in Woodlands, but potentially also for some in the community. The reality is, within the current budget arrangements, it has not been possible to uh, provide that post. I have asked officials to look and see what may be possible uh, as developments go through and the Youth Justice Agency looks at its overall budgeting uh, in the future, but unfortunately it has not been possible to get that position uh, filled at this stage. And it is clearly an issue when so many of those young people who are in custody have particular problems around speech and language, as indeed, of course, we also see issues around mental health as well. Call Ms. Anna Lowe. Thank you, Mr. Principal, Deputy Speaker. Uh, will the Minister join me in welcoming the work done by Belfast City Council and other councils in using powers at their disposal to tackle the sale of so called legal highs? and in encouraging other councils to follow suit. Um, I'm happy to endorse the good work which was done by Belfast and I think also Larne and Oma councils uh, in, you know, in, a, in addressing the issue of uh, those uh, so-called head shops which were selling so-called legal, legal highs, um, NPSs for a more accurate description. Um, I've also been in contact with the Home Office um, over the issue, um, and I'm hoping to be having a meeting with the relevant Home Office Minister when the, the responsibilities of individual ministers are sorted out, because as members will be aware, uh, the specific issue of the Misuse of Drugs Act is a reserved matter, but it is clear that good work has been done uh, by a number of councils in Northern Ireland, and that was clearly a step forward, but I do believe we need the law more comprehensively joined up in the future. Ms. Lowe for a supplementary. Thank you, uh, Sandy. Uh, th that's very welcome to hear the Minister is going to engage with the Home Office again uh, on this matter. Um, can I ask the Minister if he will involve the Irish Government uh, in banning the sale of uh, these substances as well? 
Well, um, as part of a study the Home Office did uh, in the latter part of last year, uh, they did also look specifically at the, the Irish legislation and its potential benefits. And certainly it's an issue which seems to me has been a major bonus, the, the fact that uh, the relevant shops were closed down almost overnight by and large in the Republic, uh, but we still have the problem of having to take individual action in Northern Ireland is an example where we can learn, um, as is not always the case in social matters from our neighbours across the border, uh, but the key issue will be to uh, persuade the Home Office of their responsibilities across the UK as a whole and to learn the lessons and to ensure that we and other parts of the UK get the benefit. Question three has been withdrawn. I call Mr Joe Byrne. Thank you, Mr Prince, the Speaker. Can I ask the Minister, following on from his answers earlier about NIACRO and the cuts in the budget, what consequences does he see in relation to the number of people that may end up in prison as real offenders? Well, I don't think it's possible to say what we would see um, as a direct consequence, Principal Deputy Speaker. I certainly regret the fact uh, that the Department of Justice has had to cut back some of the grants to the voluntary sector, particularly because faced with a difficult budget settlement from 2010 to 2014, the Department of Justice was able to prioritise frontline services, including those provided by our voluntary sector partners, um, and significant reductions were made uh, in the back office, which continue to be made this year as well. But the reality is the ongoing difficult budget settlement becoming even more difficult this year has meant that we can no longer protect our voluntary sector partners as we had sought to do for the first four years of devolution. Well, Mr. Byrne for supplementary. Yes, I thank the Minister for his answer. Does the Minister still have full confidence in the ACRO and in the work it does in relation to trying to rehab rehabilitate offenders? And what implications does it have for the probationary service going forward given that they also provide a vital role in relation to young offenders? Well, um, I'm not sure it's appropriate that I should say I have full confidence in, in anybody, um, particularly those which are not directly accountable to me, but I have significant confidence in the good work which has been done by a range of voluntary sector partners, not least NIACRO. Um, and I really don't wish to start, uh, start to have to name all of them, but NIACRO seems to have featured a number of times in questions today. We have had a good working relationship. We have seen a lot of good, positive work done by our NGO partners. And I also uh, have significant confidence uh, in the work being done by the Probation Service and the Youth Justice Agency as, our, as the key elements of the formal justice system, certainly by comparison uh, with what I see of probation services in England and Wales, where privatisation and financial incentives uh, does not seem to have delivered anything like the quality of service provided by the professionals and the professionally qualified social workers who work in probation here. We should be very grateful for that. I have therefore sought to protect the budgets to those frontline services, whether statutory or voluntary, as far as possible, but unfortunately I cannot protect them entirely. Question five has been withdrawn. I call Mr Sidney Anderson. Thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker. Minister, can I ask you for your assessment of the current level of staffing within uh, the Northern Ireland Prison Service? Uh, clearly, the level of staffing within the prison service is less than we would hope at this stage. Um, there have been a, a number of vacancies which are being covered by overtime, and issues are being looked at in terms of recruitment, again against the difficult budget settlement, which has seen significant reductions in the budget for the prison service this year. Well, Mr. Anderson, for supplementary. Uh, thank you, Principal Deputy Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that uh, response. Following a, a recent fire and act of arson uh, that took place in McGabry Prison as recently as the 26th of April, Minister, would you agree with me that uh, those uh, radical reductions in staffing levels and the pressures that have been placed on existing staff might have played a part in that fire? And, and do you further agree, or would you further agree, that it throws into serious doubt the ability of the directors of McGabry to manage the prison on the basis of the current levels uh, of staffing? Bearing in mind, that over this last five years there has been a reduction of some 800 staff. Well, we need to take care when we, we quote simply the numbers of staff, and I think the, the numbers Mr Anderson is giving are slightly larger than the exact numbers of reductions. Um, for example, um, specific new blocks uh, do not require anything like the same number of staff for supervision. Uh, the reduction in escorting 
of lower risk prisoners around Bagabri has uh, resulted in a reduction in numbers of those who are required there as well. Uh, but it is clear that there is a difficult management problem in Mugabri, which is probably the most complex prison anywhere in the United Kingdom, given the number of different groups of prisoners who are housed there. I believe good work is being done in Mugabri, but clearly it is an ongoing challenge. And the shortage of staff and the numbers of staff currently on sick leave make that particularly difficult. Question number seven has been withdrawn. I call Mr. Mickey Brady. Could I ask the Minister what steps he will take to address victims' concerns raised by the Spotlight Programme on Tuesday the 12th of May on the BBC uh, dealing with the Specialist Forensic Unit within Special Branch? Well, again, Principal Deputy Speaker, whilst clearly there are public concerns, uh, we do need to be, be careful in this place in terms of dealing with issues of a number of years ago I understand the, um, the specific unit within Special Branch, which is referred to, um, was wound up sometime before the devolution of justice here. But there are clearly issues of significant concern uh, relating to the deaths of police officers, relating to the deaths of civilians. And there are matters there for the investigation by the police ombudsman, which has the formal remit to do that. And I'm not sure I should say much beyond that while we allow the ombudsman's office to carry out its inquiries. Mr. Brady, for supplement. I thank the Minister for his answer. Minister, given that the show identified issues of police integrity, will the Minister now publicly encourage former and current members of the PSNI RUC uh, to cooperate fully with the Police Ombudsman and the HIU? Well, I have no problem in repeating Mr. Brady's point on that one. I have always encouraged those who uh, either serve or have served in the police service or the RUC uh, to give whatever help they can to the Ombudsman in carrying out investigations. I note that's the point which has also been made by a number of retired officers on different occasions as well. It is clearly the best way of enhancing confidence in policing alongside the good work which is being done by the Ombudsman and the work which has made the PSNI a very different body from the RUC at the time when a number of these difficulties were happening. Well, Mr. Leslie Cree. Thank you, Mr. Principal Deputy Speaker. I'd like to ask the Minister uh, for an update on the cost of damage uh, caused by a recent fire. I think it's at Iron House, Magabry. Uh, major reports estimate some 800,000. Well, Principal Deputy Speaker, I can't give Mr. Cree uh, a precise figure at this stage, though clearly there, there is work which has to go um, on to establish that. Um, I would, however, say don't necessarily believe everything you read in the Sunday papers um, when people say, well, they're suggesting 400,000, so I'd assume you double it. Well, Mr. Cree, for supplementary. I think, Chair, and that's uh, why it's always good to have the facts. But I could ask the, the Minister, by way of a supplementary, can you give us an assurance? that he's working to address the concerns of the prison service staff who have low morale there in McGavery uh, and leave, if there be any doubt, just exactly who is in charge. Well, the answer is very clear, Principal Deputy Speaker. The Director General of the Prison Service is in charge and the Governor of McGavery is in charge of McGavery and individual governors are responsible for their particular areas of responsibility. There's clearly an issue around uh, a staffing matter there, which, for example, sees a very high level of sickness absence within McGabry at the present time. Uh, but the important issue is to ensure that we don't undermine the good work being done, and we seek to ensure that the reform programme, which has produced some significant benefits in recent months at both Hyde Bank Wood, with the transformation to the college, and McGilligan, also proceeds apace at McGabry. Mr David McElveen is not in his place. Uh, time is up.